Good morning. This is Meg Riley in Minneapolis where it's sunny. We've had inches and inches of rain. It's flooding here and we're at the top of the Mississippi and it, by the time you get down to Louisiana, it's pretty scary, the Mississippi River this year. But here it is. It's going to be in the 80s. I turned the heat off and I think I don't have to have any more fires this year maybe. <laughs> Aisha, how are you besides early and newly awake? <laughs> yes, good morning. I'm Aisha Hauser in Seattle, Washington, and we have four West Coasters this morning. Yay! So you're all up at the butt crack of dawn with me. I'm so appreciative. Uh, it is not 80. It's regular cloudy here in Seattle. Um, Christina, how are you? Hi, everyone. It's Christina Rivera. I'm joining you from Charlottesville, Virginia, where it is um, yeah, just really, really warm, too warm, too soon, like 95 degrees, just ridiculous. And um, I'm ready for it to just be a little bit gentler entry into summer. Michael Tina, how's it going there? Good morning, everyone. This is Michael Tino joining you from Peekskill, New York. Um, things are going all right. It's uh, like the 9,000th day of May. Uh, right? It is May 9,000th today. Um, and May, uh, for those of you who don't know this out there in the view world, I know everyone I can see on the screen knows this, is the longest and cruelest month of the church year. Um, uh, it just is. And uh, I'm super crispy. And um, so is my 10-year-old computer. Uh, <laughs> which I'm very grateful that it that it's lasted 10 years, but I got a new computer with a much higher definition camera. So I see every wrinkle in my shirt. So if I go like this a lot during the hour, it's just because I'm super self-conscious and it's good to be with you all. Margali, you're at the tech deck. How are you? Hello, I am cold actually. It was 50 something here last night. Exactly. I I really, I turned on the heat, I'm sorry. <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, cloudy and a little cold. It's, we're supposed to be in the 70s, I'm uh, hoping. Uh, coming to you from Cromwell, Connecticut. And maybe I'm just being a little whiny. Other folks from Connecticut might feel, hey, it's nice and warm. But anyway, as you know, I will be looking for your comments and questions to so that everyone here, and especially um, our our invited guests will be able to see your questions and comments you're making uh, so that they can respond to them as time permits. So back to you, Meg. Thank you so much. So before we introduce our special guests, we take a few minutes and talk about what's new in the land of UUism. Christina, I know last week you were unable to be here because you were going out to the panel on ethics. Do I have that right? I know it has ethics in it. What, what, where were you and how it was it? Yeah, it doesn't have a name yet. So that's okay. You're, you're good. Um, basically, it was a gathering of uh, the religious professional organizations. It started out um, from the UUMA and MFC wanting to take a look as we had the UUMA on um, a couple weeks ago about redoing uh, their guidelines. And part of that is talking about um, expanding how we think about colleagues um, across professional organizations and across professions as religious professionals. Um, so the UMA actually expanded that to include um, religious educators uh, with having a representative from Lareda there. Um, and when we had them on the view, I was like, oh, this is the first time I'm hearing about it. And I travel in administrator circles. So I asked the administrators, had we been invited? And we hadn't. Um, so I emailed really quickly over and uh, God bless the UUMA. They were like, yeah, absolutely. We should have everybody at the table. If we're gonna be talking about co really cross collegial guidelines, we need to have everyone there, mea culpa. And they um, really quickly got invites out to us and to the membership professionals and to uh, the Society of Community Ministers. I think the music directors had already been in kind of in the loop. Um, so it was a really great experience. It was a great first start at what would cross collegial ethics um, look like. And it, I, I have to give a shout out for um, 
the leadership at the UMA um, because this has been the first time I've ever been in a room um, of cross collegial relation uh, people in the room when when folks who are not ordained clergy were really real about harm that they have experienced at the hands of um, ordained clergy people. Um, it was the first time I've ever experienced that without the ordained clergy people in the room saying, not all ministers and not all of us. And, you know, that's not, it was the first time I've experienced them as saying, yeah, you're right. We, and we've got to get, we've got to fix this. Um, and that in itself, if, if only for me, for that, that moment uh, was really powerful. Maybe the fact that there have been a couple of negotiated resignations because of bullying and other bad behaviors with other staff members, it's risen to a level of attention, or maybe the level of attention made that possible. I don't know, but it does feel like things are changing in a good way, and that's really yeah. heartening to hear. Michael? I think the leadership of the UU Ministers Association is really serious about changing the culture and addressing the the uh, the history of um, power, misuse of power and abuse of power. Um, I, I just think they're really very serious about that. And it just, as a member of the EU Ministers Association, it's it's been rare for me to feel pride in my professional organization. Y'all, y'all who are in Laredo feel that all, all the time. I did when I when I was a Laredo member. Um, Michael, you you're fading out. I think maybe your thing got bumped. I'm not sure. Can you all hear me? Yeah. We'll try the we'll try the computer. Yeah, there we go. And press that my new computer has great microphones. Uh, I was just saying that as a member of the UU Ministers Association, it's been rare for me to experience pride in my professional organization. And those of you who are members of Loreda feel that all the time. Uh, <laughs> but it's it's actually it's a nice feeling. And I, pre I appreciate the, the intention and the real um, explicit attention to power and how it's used, abused and misused and has been uh, on the backs of, of people with less of it. So I don't need to talk a lot about that, but it's intentional. So may I just, um, there, okay. We just got a comment, hashtag not all ministers. So here's the thing, because this also comes when we talk about anti-racism and oppression, not all white people. It shuts down the conversation. We have had ministers bully staff. We have had people leave Unitarian Universalism because of harm caused by ordained clergy and power. When we simply say hashtag not all ministers, we shut down that reality and we, we shut down that truth. Of course, it is not all ministers. It is not all white people that are harmful. It is not all able-bodied people that are terrible. And until we name the harm caused by people who have institutional authority and power, we will not get to the issue. So thank you, Christina, for naming that you were in a room where Dane clergy didn't do that. I've been in countless conversations where I've had ministers say, not, it's not me, uh, not me, not me. Okay, but then when do we get to what the issues are? Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. I think um, and, and there's a there's a note here from uh, from Janine Gelsinger who was also attend who also attended she attended on behalf of the membership professionals and she just said seconded to everything um, Chris said the UMA leadership is doing some incredible work it was amazing to be in that room and with everybody really staying at the table and listening and not defensive there was a lot of trust built on that trust building that went on. I think it's really important for us to remember that that shutting down of the conversation is a power move, especially because of course not everybody, like you were supposed to be decent. <laughs> so- uh, Thank you. So I don't think that's helpful either in the sense of uh, just confirming a practice of fragility. So it's really, easy for us to be concerned about that but I just think if we can hold still just a little longer 
and actually keep talking it's probably way more helpful yeah and i always say i keep thinking this stuff i just don't have to share it <laughs> Right. Yeah, it's, right. it's, it's like, oh, but wait, wait. It's like, shut up, just shut up right now. Yeah, we can do that. We can think and keep it to ourselves. We can think all kinds of stuff we don't even want to be thinking and just keep our mouths shut about it. So, Christina, you had big news that you shared this week. Big I did. Um, I shared that I have submitted my resignation to do the congregation here in Charlottesville, Virginia. I'll be serving uh, through the end of August or September. Um, the lead minister here um, at the same time also submitted um, his resignation. He'll be leaving at the end of um, June. Um, and this really has a lot to do with, with, um, you know, we were just talking about bad behavior and, and holding each other accountable. And part of that also has to be holding congregations accountable for their behavior. Um, it's been no secret that I've experienced, um, you know, some overt racism um, here at the congregation in Charlottesville. Um, and one of the things, you know, that I called out when that happened was that there is a culture of complicity in our congregations that allow um, folks who allow and affirm folks in that bad, um, call it bad behavior or non-confidential behavior, racist behavior, whatever you want to do. Um, and at a certain point, it just it's it's too much. I'm I'm here to serve Unitarian Universalism, and my ministry is currently serving that at this congregation. Um, but that doesn't mean that that we continue to allow ourselves to be harmed. Um, and so for me and my family, um, it became very clear that, that the congregation was not interested in um, mitigating that harm. Um, and so, um, for me to leave was really the way that that was going to be able to um, to happen. Um, so it's really it's 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 it was a really difficult decision. Um, I don't feel good about it. I've never left a job without having another job and a half lined up, um, and so that's really scary. Um, and and in this case, necessary. So. Um, I think that you know our congregations have work ahead of them, and they've. I'm not the only religious professional, you know, out there experiencing harm, um, and congregations have a, a duty and responsibility to be supporting their religious professionals and the religious professionals of color um, in in a way that makes it possible for all of us to serve Unitarian Universalism. Well, that is very sad. And I just want to name that you serve Unitarian Universalism in many ways, including being on The View, which is of great service to the movement. And I hope that won't change. Although I guess your future is a little, um, you don't know right now. But um, just to name that your congregation is one piece of a life of devotion and service that is really important to many of us. So thank you for that. And and I'm really sorry. Well, that was that, that announcement. Anything else in the movement before we move on to our show today? Meg Richardson, it's gonna be interesting with two Megs. Every time someone talks to the other Meg, I think they're talking to me. Meg Richardson, I, I, yes. I um, wanted to share good news that we just graduated nearly 20 um, students from Starking School for the Ministry. And so they are going out to bless the world. Fantastic. That's great. Yeah. Oh, yes. It's a season of graduations and people getting ready to move and change lives in many ways. 
Um, and so we're really excited about today's shows, which is talking about how to be congregations that are welcoming to everybody who's there, including people with disabilities and special needs, uh, which in some ways is everyone and in some ways is particular communities. So let's introduce our three guests who are all, as Asia said, from the West Coast. So we're all up early and doing a special favor by being here. So Reverend Dr. Meg Richardson teaches UU history at Star King School for the Ministry, is a member of Mount Diablo UU Church in Northern California, and wants to add that she has a 17-year-old daughter with, who has autism. And we're very excited to have Dr. Bethany McKinney Fox, who's the founding pastor of Beloved Everybody Church. What a great name. Director of Disability Services and Adjunct Professor of Christian Ethics at Fuller Seminary, and the author of a new book, Disability in the Way of Jesus. And um, Bethany, do you have it? Can you wave it around? Yeah, wave it around. And we've put, uh, Margalie, are you putting the link over on the, um, oh, let's see Yay! it. Yay! Excellent. It has right. a blurb from John Vanier, y'all. Wow. Thank you for joining us. We very much appreciate it. And finally, Dr. Therese, uh, Reverend, she feels like a doctor. Sure, <laughs> sure. <laughs> Therese Soto, who is the incoming lead minister of the First Unitarian Church of Oakland. Woo! They live with their partner, the Reverend Sean Parker Dennison, up in Oregon still, I think, and believe yeah. that Unitarian Universalism could be a major force in interrupting ableism and everybody who has it hold it up author of an amazing new book of poetry that I really can't recommend highly enough. I, I've been just savoring it like an oasis. It's, it's really wonderful. Thank you and congratulations on that, Teresa. So let's, uh, each of you is working in different contexts, um, but let's talk about, um, well, where do you wanna start? We could start anywhere. Let's start with your book, Bethany. Let's start with the scripture, because we've all, well, I mean, many of us have heard horror stories about scriptures being abused to abuse people, but you're, you've written, I, I guess, because I will get it, but I haven't seen it, a book that's more liberating about scripture. So let's start with some theology here. Um, how would you, if you were describing your book to somebody like me who doesn't know about it, what would you say? Yeah, so... Um just based on what you said, uh, that really was the impetus of the book. I am kind of a Jesus person. I'm a pretty big fan. And so it was really uh, baffling and heartbreaking to notice that people wanting to follow Jesus, church communities wanting to follow Jesus, were creating these practices they called healing that were really harmful often for people with disabilities. And so my book kind of is wanting to think about, you know, that wasn't the case when Jesus interacted with people. So if that is the case and what we're doing today, we can't really think of that in any way as being followers of Jesus, if we're, if we're doing harm and that's not what Jesus was doing. So basically it's just kind of recognizing that the lenses that we bring into our readings of scripture, how we think about what disability means, what health means, what healing means, what a good body is, those kinds of presuppositions impact what things we tend to notice in a narrative and what things we tend to ignore or not count as part of a healing. So, um, you know, especially here in the West, we tend to have a pretty biomedical framework that we're working with when we think about bodies and we think about what healing looks like. We tend to think about curing uh, when we think about healing. And so when we look at a text, it ends up being like, oh yeah, well, here's this person who was blind and the whole story is about their sight being restored and that's the point of it. Um, but really, if that was the point of it, this text could all be like two verses long and not 40 verses long, if that's really what the crux of the issue was. Um, and they're not all that long, but the reality is there seems to be a lot more going on in the biblical concept of wholeness and healing and health and shalom, then when we tend to read these texts from a more curative or biomedical framework. So it's just kind of digging into that, figuring out what healing in the way of Jesus might look like today. Yeah. How do you, how would you describe what healing looks like? In the congregation, what does healing look like? 
Yeah, well, it's uh, in the book, there are seven marks of healing in the way of Jesus. And um, just, you know, briefly, it has to do with the person who is the supposed recipient of healing, um, appreciating or having a positive response to what's happening. Um, also, the transformation happens on multiple levels. Um, the body is important. It doesn't kind of say that we should just forget that people have bodies and focus only on healing in other ways. Um, but it does mean that curing and healing in the body don't really have to be the same thing. There can be some kinds of healing or restoration in bodies without it needing to be um, what we tend to call curing. And so it really is just a sense of like when Jesus interacted with people on the margins who had various disabilities or impairments or um, other kinds of chronic illnesses, um, there was a restoration to community. There was a way that they were spiritually transformed. Um, there was a way that their whole lives were changed. Um, and that the community was changed. I think that's something we leave out a lot when we think about healing is we tend to think of it on a very individual basis that there's this person receiving the healing, but in the texts, in the biblical texts with Jesus, there's a lot of emphasis on what happens to the community and what their reactions are. Um, they're amazed, they're worshiping, they're afraid, they're angry. And so there's some involvement of what of the, the community is impacted um, as well. And so there is some change that happens on a broader level. And so it just is, the, the subtitle of the book is Holistic Healing in the Gospels and the Church. So that word holistic is kind of what we're getting under. And when we think about disability, realizing that disability is only in part about what's happening in a person's body and is even more about the ways we've constructed systems, including church systems, um, both physically, socially, um, organizationally, to kind of prioritize certain kinds of gifts or abilities and to, um, that, that that's a way that we've created disabling structures. And so part of what healing would look like then is removing those barriers and creating um, communities that are you know, accessible at the very minimum. And um, beyond that, obviously celebrating of people in our communities with disabilities and all that. So Did you, that's, that's a brief synopsis. That's, that's really beautiful. There was a little blip, but I want to make sure I heard you right. I think you used the frame disabling structures. Is that yeah. what I heard you say? Yeah, uh -huh. just that. Yeah. Um, I think when we tend, there's different models of thinking about disability. So like thinking about it from a medical perspective tends to think that what disables a person is, you know, that they have trouble walking or that they can't see well, or that they, their brain processes things in a certain way. And that's like kind of what we tend to think is the thing that disables someone, but really people can move through the world and, you know, think in different ways. And it's because we've created structures that are not made for everyone, that that's kind of what creates a disabling environment. So that's a piece of, yeah. So thanks. Thank you. So our other two guests, I, I'm curious because most of our congregations aren't as focused on what Jesus did or didn't say or do, but all of what you're saying certainly um, has a lot of resonance in Unitarian Universalism. So I'm wondering, uh, Teresa, if you want to say how that theology is alive in the UU congregations that you know? Well, I think that most congregations would at least be open to using one of the sections of story to talk about the model. So I have done that before to say, you know, you're used to thinking of this as where the disability is the problem, but what if we look at where the transformation actually happened in this narrative? and it ends up being the community. And you're missing your blessing because you're not even in the conversation. So I have done that before. <laughs> and um, I think that uh, using it from a balcony view is also useful in terms of saying, um, just because you have feelings about someone having a disability 
doesn't mean it's actually bad. And we need to talk about what else is what else is possible here for you to be the beloved community for you to be engaged with your values for you to do what you say you mean to do your current relationship is insufficient so um that too and meg you you referenced your congregation and your daughter and so I'm not sure if your historic view of theology fits into this or not, but I'm curious from your life in congregations or, the, or history, well, where you for, see Unitarian Universalism coming into this. For you use, we usually approach this from our first principle, which is the inherent worth and dignity of every person. Um, but I was struck when Bethany was talking about um, the response of the disciples to Jesus after Jesus was raised from the dead. And there was a whole spectrum of response from people who saw Jesus and knew Jesus was the same Jesus, Jesus had always been, and the ones who were alienated and put off and um, didn't know how to act. Um, the, and then Thomas, who approached Jesus with the curiosity of a child and wanted to touch the holes and um, I, I see that. I see that in our congregations. You know, uh, there's a range of response to an individual with a disability. And it's usually the religious educators that are, we have families come in with uh, children in the spectrum and the range of um, abilities and on the autism spectrum. So I've had several families over the years who say this is what we need here is what would help my child. And sometimes it's the parent being in the room, sometimes it's not. And it's a matter of having the conversation. And again, I need to lift up C.D. Beale, this year's Angus McLean winner who said, pre, who, who uses the phrase preemptive radical inclusion. Let's set up our congregations and our faith communities as if everyone is already in the room. So what does it look like to be inclusive in all manner of ways? Pretty recently, I was in a congregation that had uh, one of the important spaces in the building that wasn't accessible. So I did the runaround that I had to do to get in there. And one of the people came up to me and said, well, it's not very accessible because the door doesn't have an opener. And my experience is that when someone just says it, like a statement, that they're waiting for me to say it's okay. And mostly it's not okay. So I just hold still. And I said, yeah, it's not. And she said, well, we've been trying, but it hasn't worked. And I said, yeah, probably need to try again. And she said, um, well, you know, it's really expensive. I said, yeah, good thing you have the money. And she said, well, we're only going to be here two years. And I said, well, two years is kind of a long time, don't you think, since this is an important space? And um, then I said, well, I said, the thing is, you don't know whose life you're going to save by being their friend here in this building. And then they said, oh, you're very convincing. And the thing is, you already have everything in front of you to convince yourself. And it's really important for us not to ask each other to justify our own presence and our own existence. And if the person had understood a couple of things, first of all, that they were asking me to do that, right? Asking me to justify my inclusion. And second, that there wasn't anything wrong with my presence in terms of uh, what it required. The disabling condition was in the physical space. So, so for us to keep practicing about those distinctions really matters. Because one thing about what Aisha just said about the religious educators really being uh, in with a lot of direct engagement with including all different kinds of folks is that there's a lot of competence there, right? A lot of built up skill. But in all the places that we haven't talked about it, 
and we've let it be awkward and be a conversation about expense, our skills are a lot lower. I also want to lift up Sally Patton's book, which is actually free on the UUA.org website, uh, Welcoming Children with Special Needs. About 10 or 15 years, I don't even remember when, maybe 10 years ago, she used to do a workshop that was quite extraordinary. Um, and she talked a lot about, uh, especially children on the autism spectrum, which I believe uh, she has at least one child in that way. Meg, do you want to talk, Meg Richardson, do you want to talk about your Facebook support group? Um, and actually, before we before we hit that, I want to add on to what uh, Teresa was saying, is um, that what a blessing that adding that door, you know, it didn't just, it wouldn't just serve that congregation, it would serve everybody who came after them. Like, so what if they weren't in that space for only two years, right? Well, that, that isn't our sole, our sole commodification of what benefits us as congregations and Unitarian Universalists is not our faith. That is not who we are as Unitarian. That is not what our theology says. It's not just about what benefits us at, in this moment in time and that us being very narrowly defined in many cases. Um, so yeah, so you are there two years, maybe you're there six months, you know? Yeah, do it anyways. Bethany, you wanted to come in before we move on to the, to the work of the parents, uh-huh. Yeah, can I just ask a question? Because part of the reason in my tradition that for writing this book was that the kind of general theology or theological commitment of like everyone's created in the image of God isn't always meaty enough for us to do these things that require money and time and for people to change their minds when they feel like quote unquote inconvenienced. So I'm wondering, I know a lot of you are referring to the first principle in um, for you, you folks uh, about the worth and I'm going to get it wrong, but the worth and dignity of every human person. Um, do you feel like that is robust enough or goes deep enough in your communities to kind of, is there more theological places to draw from? So just before we got off the theological topic, I just want to kind of was curious about your own, your own community and where, where that was coming from. That's a great question. That's a great question because I think that can be this very individualistic way of looking at who we are. And then it is, it is the one that's lifted up the most, but I actually think our interdependence is the most important one for looking at this because otherwise, so one of our other principles is that we're all interconnected, that we're all part of an interdependent web. And, um, you know, it, that one to me takes it to uh, what the inherent worth and dignity of every person I have seen lead to is that individuals need to prove their their worth so that they are entitled to attention and elevator, whatever it is, it, it falls back on the person. But I think the one about interdependence says, we all need each other and we're not complete without all of the pieces. And, and the, more, the more we are preemptively inclusive, the, the stronger we will be. And so as a community, and, and so to me, that one is, where I go for the theological depth on it more than the inherent worth and dignity of every person, which in my experience where that often leads is very privileged people insisting that their worth and dignity is not being <laughs> respected in a room. And it's really boring by now after decades of it. So, and that's not to say I don't believe in the inherent worth and dignity of every person, but I think as a starting place, it has less I think you used the word robust. It's less robust. Other Meg, yes. <laughs> I just, I, I grew up with the principles because I grew up UU. And um, I used to think the first principle didn't say very much. And what I have realized since then is that the first principle is not mine to claim. It is mine to, to do. And I have first principle work to do to recognize and affirm the inherent worth and dignity of others. And I think that's where we get the problem of privileged people saying, but I have inherent dignity. And um, 
I thought I'd share my story was um, we went, we moved from a congregation where my, my, um, I had one baby toddler, and then we moved to a very isolated rural place where it would take me an hour or 45 minutes on Sunday morning to get there to a UU fellowship or a UU church. And my daughter, my youngest daughter had just been diagnosed with autism. And I called up to say that she was three and very similar to any toddler as far as tons of energy and um, cute as anything. And I called up to say that I had two kids and one with autism. And instead of giving me the choice, did I want to stay with her or did I want to um, leave her? They told me that I would be required to stay with her in Sunday school. And I thought, I'm not driving an hour so I can color with Rebecca. And I didn't go. And I didn't go to church for almost 10 years. It kept me out. And um, my fifth grade grandfather was a universalist minister. I'm an ordained person. And it kept me out. I had my own exodus about that. And then we moved to California where there were tons of UU churches in easy driving distance. And I um, picked the one with the biggest RE program. And we went there our first Sunday in California. And that first Sunday was the um, harvest Sunday, I guess. And there was a bouncy castle. There were cupcakes with blue icing. And I thought we were going to do church shopping, but my children told me they had found their spirits home. So it, it was a very different experience and very welcoming experience. I told them there's not going to be a bouncy castle next week and they didn't care. So, so that, that's my experience. It's, it's that's amazing. Right. That's really neat. And I, I'm really grateful for the ability to think about how the image of God or the worth and dignity of everyone doesn't really power us forward. Um, and I think because some of the things are more historical than I love the way Meg framed it about this is my work to do. Um, because my first impression of Unitarian Universalism was that I had to hurry up and get there because Universal was right in the name. So certainly it was going to be accessible. Right? And then my experience was a lot different than that. But that's our possibility, which is the exciting part. And I think, you know, it's interesting to, to think about theology and principles, because I think that our theology and our principles are as robust as we're willing to make them in a certain way. And it matters less exactly which principle we reference than where we live our theology. And if, if we're living the principle of inherent worth and dignity in relationship with other people, in actual relationship with other people, then when someone says, I can't get in that room, we care, right? <laughs> and, and we do what we need to do to make sure they can get in that room. Um, and if we're living our principles and our theology as individual, individualistic ways to prop up privilege, then when someone says, I can't get in that room, we go, oh, well, that's just really terrible. I'm sorry, I won't spend the money to get you in that room. Um, and, you know, it's still the same, it's the principle, same principle, but it's where that, where that principle lives. Does it, is it something that lives inside of me or is it something that lives between and among us? Um, and I'm big on our principles living between and among us. Um, Meg? I just, um, when a room is not accessible, that's very clear that there are stairs or a door that's not wide enough or something like that. So you can imagine um, there may be things that would prevent somebody with autism from getting in the room that are less visible. And so we're doing an even worse job. If we're doing a crappy job on the things we can see, we're doing a much worse job on the other stuff. Um, and um, I, I think for me, um, some of the things that I see that 
might be perceived as accommodations for my daughter tend to be things that also work well for introverts, for example. And so, so when we fix these things, when we fix the steps or the, um, the noisy fluorescent light or, you know, whatever it is, we're really helping a lot of people. We're not just helping the people who are identified as disabled. And, and we're helping everyone live a theology of welcome and openness and relationship, right? So even if the noisy fluorescent light doesn't bother me, the fact that I can now share my spiritual community with someone for whom that noisy fluorescent light is a barrier to their inclusion means that my spiritual journey is enhanced. Um, yeah, it's it, it's it's all about the us. If, That's if, the shift we need, exactly to Teresa's point and the response of we, we may or may not have money or we're only going to be here two years. And to Christina's point, if we saw each other as more, I actually am not a fan of the first principle. I took a class with Meg and she knows that. Um, however, I appreciate the framing of this is my work to do as a verb almost, a verb. And um, if, if we embodied more the idea that we are connected, we're going to do all we can so people don't feel not universally included in who we are together. And it's a good modeling for folks who are out in the world if we can do this in our spaces. What is, how does this feel and how do we affirm each other? Um, it's compelling. Yeah, and I'd, I'd, go beyond, I'd go beyond the principles. I'd go to our founding theology that says we already have heaven on earth, right? We already have all of the resources that we need in order for people to feel heaven on earth and experience heaven on earth. We have everything that we need. We just need to actually, our work as Unitarian Universalists is to make that felt by everyone, right? And to make that be everyone's experience. That's our work. I love, and this is back to Beth and the original framing, putting disability into the community and healing into the community. And so I'd, I'd love to hear stories of healing from communities um, that are, that are um, because I know, you know, when you're in those rooms, at least for me, there's a deeper breath. There's a sense that other people in the room are also breathing. <laughs> you know, it just feels different. And um and I'm curious, you know, to hear some, some stories of where people are experiencing that either in UU congregations or other communities and places, because I think we can learn from each other. I have a small example that I carry in my heart. Uh, I went to a congregation that had chairs instead of pews, but they hadn't left any space for wheelchairs or strollers or walkers or other things to arrive and be not be, not have to um, move chairs, right? Ask someone, can you take a couple of chairs out? Um, so we got there that morning and it had been a thing. It's always a thing for disabled people to get to church. So getting ready, going over, taking public transportation, arriving in a new place, and then there's no place to park. So after the service, my friend went and spoke to the minister and said, uh, we're really excited to be here. And my friend had a hard time because we had to rearrange the furniture before we could arrive. And <laughs> that minister came down off the chancel and started taking chairs out. And it's a small thing in terms of like, yeah, you're supposed to be decent like that. But he didn't have to take it to a committee and he didn't have to like Google it or wonder about it or call a colleague. He just went ahead and moved the chair, which was really generous and really compassionate and something we can do for each other. And um, I keep remembering that I keep learning that I don't have to wait for permission to do my mission. 
like what I'm supposed to do, be doing in the world, I'm going to go ahead and do it. So just a small one. What excellent modeling too. What that I mean, just do it. We don't have to I love when I'm around today, so I love it. Don't make it weird. You know, we don't have to make it weird. We could we could do the opposite of making it weird. We can make it great. Um, Meg, I don't Meg Richardson, I don't want to lose uh, the Facebook page in case folks want to connect to it. I um I just started, so it's got like three members, but I started a group for support for parents and guardians of parents, um, people with special needs of all ages. Um, and so I called it the first principle, UU parents and guardians of special need children and adults. And I did it, I I did it for parents and guardians because that's what I am. And so um, it's a support group. I know that there's probably need for tons of groups for different things, but that's what this one is. So um, I had heard, I don't want to discount the experience of physical barriers to worship because I had heard when I started looking into all this stuff that um, congregations are better at being reactive, like somebody's in a car accident and needs a ramp and that they build the ramp. And so I'd heard that they are better at doing that sort of thing. And then when I asked around, I heard that really isn't true, that people raise all kinds of bizarre um, reasons against doing simple things, what seems like a simple thing, um, like that it's a historic building or, um, you know, just different things that seem very strange to me, but, um, but it, it is real. I'd like to hear more about Beloved Everybody. Bethany, can you tell us about that? Sure. Um, so this is a very pretty young, a year and a half ago, uh, church startup. And it's basically, um, you know, I have a lot of friends and have been in community with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and uh, recognized that in a lot of our churches. Um, so my I'm affiliated with the Presbyterian denomination and we tend to be um, very verbal and very intellectual in certain ways in our practices and in our gatherings, you know, um, and as I think is true across traditions, uh, churches tend to be slow to change how they do things. And so, um, you know, I was kind of recognizing that to truly create a worship gathering that was fully inclusive, particularly to people with intellectual disabilities for whom, you know, a 20 minute abstract theoretical, theological speech from the front of the room wasn't gonna really be speaking to them or really helping them to grow spiritually. Um, you know, and realizing that to change the carpet color in a congregation can take three years um, and many arguments. So I kind of just realized, um, so, that, so that's why we started a new church as opposed to kind of working within an already formed community just to be able to say yes to this new model um, instead of, I think both work is really important, working within established congregations and starting new things. But um, so, so our church gatherings are very kind of relational, interactive. There's very little um, kind of passive participation. It's a lot of, um, and it's very adaptable. So. Uh, you know, we have people with PhDs in the community, and then we have people um, who are autistic and may not use a lot of language in their, as their form of communication and uh, stuff in between. So, um, so yeah, so it's just been, it's kind of experimentation at this point, figuring out what are practices that we can do as a community that really do call us all to connect to God, to ourselves, to one another in the very wild diversity wild and beautiful diversity uh, that we have in our in our midst. And because I still have a full-time job at the moment, it's just kind of a small community, which has been good because it's given us room to experiment and uh, try things out and say, okay, this seems to work well. And okay, maybe not that. So um, it's, been a, it's been a fun journey, but it's really great to have, um, and what I really like the next step in the game 
because the, the vision is really to have people with intellectual disabilities, not only as full participants, but also sharing and leadership. And it's been important to think about what does that actually look like? And what does that mean? How would somebody who doesn't use language to communicate, what does it look like for them to be a leader? Um, and so we're kind of just figuring that out. And um, this year, it, I would really love if we were able to um, find, and when I move into more um, times but with the church ministry, um, it would be great to find someone with an intellectual disability who could be like a co-pastor with me that we could truly like minister together. Um, that's really my hope for this coming year to have that shared leadership and figure out what that can look like on the ground. So thanks for asking. That's, that's where we're at. It strikes me, you know, we had a few weeks ago, we had uh, Darrell Farrar, who's a musician come and speaking. And he was talking about how much starting with complex word-based um, church services aren't really very transformative for anybody. So I'm just listening to you and thinking, you know, it, I would be really interested in what the actual physical experience is. Is there a lot of music or, or touch or, I'm, or some people don't want touch? I, how, like you said, some things work well. I'm really curious what you notice works well, or maybe it's too soon to tell. I don't want to put you on the spot. No, I mean, I'm happy to share a little bit. Um, the touch thing is interesting. I will share what we do in terms of touch because uh, we have a member who um, it's not really good for them to be hugged, but they aren't able to express that. Um, and so we had to kind of come up with a way to communicate that to other people because a lot of people want to hug everybody. And um, there's a way that that's not always helpful. So we had to think about particularly for this person, um, what we could do. So now we have like a name tag system that's uh, based on a, uh, like a stoplight, so like red, oops, sorry, this is my office phone. Um, sorry about that. Um, we have a name tag system that's like red, yellow, and green, where if someone has a red sticker, it means um, like no touching, you can wave, you can smile, um, but not physical touch. Yellow um, is like a handshake or a high five. Green means you can ask for a hug. So that's just a way that people can kind of non-verbally communicate um, what they're comfortable with. And people without, I mean, every, other people have been really, like not just the person who was the kind of creator of this idea, um, but the whole community has really benefited from this. And you can change from week to week, like if you have a cold one week or whatever. Um, so that's one thing. But in terms of what we actually do in the gathering itself, I would say one thing that has worked especially well um, is our embodiment of scripture. So we like act out scripture narratives. We, if it's, a, if it's not a narrative, but it's more like a Psalm, we'll sometimes do just embodied, people will make up embodied movements to go with like um, the poetry of a Psalm, something like that. Um, and I would say, you know, honestly, the, the acting out of the texts is really, amazing and it, it it's a way of and that's a way of doing some shared leadership because people kind of bring their own personality into it there really isn't uh i don't tell them how to act out their part <laughs> i just kind of read the thing and they do their thing um and it's kind of awesome like uh just when when we met in december and we're doing the text about um where the angel gabriel announces to mary that she's pregnant and everything and um, so we had a <clears throat> this super wonderful autistic man who's in our community um, was the angel Gabriel. And when he was um, leaning over to Mary to say, do not be afraid. So, you know, I just kind of am the narrator. So I say, the like, angel Gabriel said, do not be afraid. And so then I'm like, okay, you know, do not be afraid. So he leaned over to Mary and just whispered, do not be afraid. And it was so beautiful. And it's like things like that where it's like, you don't know what you're gonna get. And so it's like, we kind of create the bowl. I feel like my job as the pastor at this point is to bring the table that has the space around it for people to come to. But then the people bring, it's like a potluck. So everybody's bringing their uh, 
thing to put on the table and it's kind of a beautiful and sometimes it works sometimes it's beautiful and sometimes you're like what just happened who knows but i feel like god and the spirit can work through everything so um anyway so that's just kind of a brief thing i love how open-hearted and just gen generous of spirit that 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 all is and and that's what i um wish for Unitarian Universalism is to be that open-hearted. And I one time, I one time led a service and I said to the minister, oh, I like to go off script. And he literally like the blood drained from his face, like, don't go off script, don't go off script. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So it was kind of, I was kind of worried for him, but um, I love how open-hearted <laughs> that, that whole service is. So thank you for that gift. We just have a few more minutes that we didn't get to so many things. So I want to ask our guests if there was something you really wanted to say that um, we haven't gotten to talk about at all. Um, any of you three. I really like that we did get to talk a little bit about uh, accessibility, physical barriers being like the easiest part, the lowest fruit. It really is. So one of the other things we do for each other is figure out the rest, but the best way that happens is in a connected way. And so my friends know, I never know what time it is. My phone can say what time it is, but I don't understand what that means for my schedule. So my brain just doesn't know what time it is. I don't know how it works, the little hand, and then you count by five on the big hand, and all that, but I don't understand it. So one way that people make things accessible for me is when they translate time zones and say, hey, Teresa, in your time zone, you need to be ready at such and such a clock, right? Because even if I understand that it's later in New York, I'll still count the wrong direction or something. And I'm only telling that story to say, we assume that everyone has everything really easy. Like everyone else's life is easy, but so many people are waiting to be included in a really specific way because something is hard for them. And so when we talk about, uh, accommodations for autistic folks overlapping with what works for introverts it's that same kind of like hey i see your difficulty i'm here to hold that with you here's what i've got let me know what else we can talk about right if i came to your house and i said to you well i'm vegetarian and you made a big bowl of meatballs that's that same difficulty the same idea that we're not connecting in what we meant to do. And you would never do that. But for other things, we don't ask each other and give each other easy stuff. So I think people worry, right? They've had experiences and they worry. Is someone going to get mad if I ask them what they need? And so we have to talk about our worries as well, I think. I read a beautiful poem about worry just this morning. <laughs> I, I feel very strongly that Rebecca has been a part of our church family. And when she plays her clarinet or gives her coming of age speech or, um, or acts in a play, I, I feel that the church congregation responds to her as if she were their child. She is a child of the church and a gift. Well, thank you so much. I hope, I hope you'll all be willing to come back because this is uh, an evergreen topic. <laughs> and it's really exciting to see the directions that everybody's work is going with it. Next week, we have Blue to talk about the Harper Jordan Symposium on Black Theology coming to my hometown in the fall. And Michael Slack and Tiki and Noor Amin will be here. So that'll be great. And meanwhile, um, 
Yeah, be kind to yourself and don't make meatballs for vegetarians. Don't do it. <laughs> I'm having a t-shirt made.